for most people, buying a new journal and making New Year's resolutions are to lose weight are normal. But there is nothing normal about your compulsion to lose weight. You buy a marked down Christmas journal with a candy cane striped cover and start keeping yet another food diary. A secret one, yes, one in, but one in which you also lie to yourself. You pause, then write, I might have some issues with food, maybe. After that, just, just in case someone like a homicide detective or your mom are reading this in some future world <laughs> where you are dead or missing, um, you write, I just eat and snack too much. You picture that good-looking actor who plays a detective on one of those hour-long TV mysteries that are always on cable. He will hold this candy cane striped journal in his long, slender fingers. He will read this and understand you are not crazy. It doesn't matter that doctors have never labeled you overweight. Something has warped inside you and you feel fat. You look fat in the mirror. You want to be skinnier. You record your breakfast, lunch, and dinner items with their calorie counts listed in your candy cane journal, and you lose a few pounds in two weeks. Hooray! <laughs> but it's not enough. You want to lose more weight. You slash your calorie intake to an unhealthy 900 calories a day and start substituting Diet Cokes, chewing gum, and black coffee for food. It backfires. You're starving at 10 a.m. and you eat your lunch two hours early. You hate losing control like this, but it only gets worse. By 5 p.m., you're starving again, and your snack of four crackers turns into 40 crackers, plus tortillas, plus a yogurt. You write the food items down, but leave out the quantity. You do not need to be specific in writing. You know how much you ate. That week, the bathroom scale says you've gained three pounds. What is going on that I can't lose weight? You write that in the journal. It's a, it's a slight white lie that you've included for the benefit of that handsome detective. He's gonna read this and shake his head slowly, full of empathy for your struggle. Months pass like this. People notice you're tired and grumpy nearly constantly. Acne scars the pasty skin around your lips and cheeks. <clears throat> One night at home alone, you go off the rails, filling your stomach with all of the healthy snacks you keep in the pantry, raisins, sunflower seeds, dried apple rings, soy nuts, peanut butter from the jar. You cannot stop eating until empty packages fill the trash can and nothing is left on your kitchen shelves but uncooked pasta and cans of beans and olives. You write every item down, but you leave out the quantities and the calorie count. I know I ate too much. You take the trash out immediately so you don't have to see the evidence, and you drink a bottle of wine to forget about it and the detective's concerned face. Throwing it up is the easiest way to solve the problem. You avoid You avoid your own eyes in the bathroom mirror, and you kneel in front of the toilet as if to pray, and you shove your index finger down your throat. You force yourself to vomit. Better, you think when that's over. Now, don't do that again. But you do it again and again. By June, the compulsion to binge and purge has taken over, some days forcing you to complete its disgusting cycle several times in one day. You hate yourself so much. You pick up that stupid candy cane journal and you write four sentences. It is your first call for help. 
For a moment, you wish that imaginary detective or your mom would read this and save you from yourself. I am such a mess, you write. I can't stop eating and throwing up. I've done it four times today. I can't make myself stop. I feel like I'm rotting from the inside. I've got this emptiness I can't fill. You dispatch the second call for help a few weeks later via an email to an eating disorder clinic. You do this because you can no longer control the binges and purges, but also because you're finding it harder and harder to get the food up. Your body seems to have awakened. You enter the eating disorder program. A month later, you buy a new journal with a waterfall on the cover because you have destroyed the candy cane journal. You don't want any reminders of those dark days. You write in this journal about your feelings because that is what your therapist, Courtney, says to do. You make yourself tell the truth no matter how uncomfortable it is. You have made it four days without a binge. You have a list of five new rules about eating from Courtney. They are one day at a time. No food diaries, no calorie counting, no weighing yourself and no throwing up, no matter what you eat. If her rules don't work, all that's left is an exorcism. You learn how to knit because Courtney said you should keep your hands busy. So you sit at home and knit and try not to binge. A multitude of problems descends on you like a piano falling from the sky. You are in debt, you are fat. Your skin is terrible. You'll never be normal. Wait, you're not fat. Not at all. A voice tells you that you've already messed up your eating for the day, so why not mess it up some more? You'll never be able to stop. You are disgusting. Why not do it tonight? No one has to know. But Courtney will ask if you did. You don't want to disappoint her or yourself. So you mentally tick off a list of bulimia's dangers from that pamphlet Courtney gave you. Irregular heartbeat, ruptured esophagus, stomach ulcers, kidney failure. They don't seem like real threats, but Courtney says they are. She gave you the pamphlet as though the words on paper would convince you. But maybe there is truth to it. Remember the day you binged and purged four times in 10 hours? How your heart knocked against your chest for what seemed like hours? How your throat burned like an open wound? Your body fought you that day. You don't wanna do that again. Pick up your pen and write how you feel in the journal. I feel anxious, I feel numb. You don't care who reads this journal anymore. You just want to stop. You put the journal down, pick up the knitting needles, and the six inches of scarf you've knitted this week. Make a stitch. Now make another one. The soft rhythm of clacking needles and the scratchy soft feel of the wool is your meditation. One stitch at a time. 